check one two i just want to test uh, this is the uh, dr robert livingston interview uh, november 21st 1993 um, first of all to establish uh, a bit of your credentials because uh, i only have a 90 90 minute tape here <laughs> a little bit about your background born in boston raised in oregon went to stanford university stanford medical school had a residency in internal medicine went into World War II, ran a hospital for wounded Okinawans and wounded Japanese prisoners of war. Uh, went to China for 10 months uh, as a translator, actually, for the first part, and then uh, head of a medical uh, laboratory battalion. And um, then came back to teach uh, at uh, Stanford, Yale, Harvard, UCLA, and then was in the public health service for a period, and then established a department of neurosciences at the University of California, San Diego in 1964, and retired in 1989. Um, that's impressive right there. Uh, first of all, let's, let's go to November 22nd, 1963, uh, when you had heard that, that President Kennedy had been shot. First, a lot of people remember where they were, what they were doing. Tell the story. I was on a site visit uh, at Harvard. I was in the MGH, the Massachusetts General Hospital. Somebody coming down the hall said, uh, President Kennedy has been shot, or the President has been shot. And we retreated to a room where we could hear the news on the radio. I left immediately as fast as I could go and speeded the taxi to Logan Field, flew by the shuttle from directly from Boston to Washington, got the taxi driver in Washington to turn the radio on for the news, uh, went to Bethesda. And uh, later that afternoon, uh, after hearing the news and, and hearing some of the details that were given out from the doctors at Parkland, you were compelled to call Dr. Humes. Yes. <clears throat> I was uh, in the public health service at that time, living in Bethesda and working in Bethesda at the uh, National Institutes of Health. I had heard by radio and seen some interviews and television indicating that the Parkland Hospital physicians had seen a small, neat wound in the neck just to the right of the trachea. This had to be a wound of entrance. I'd seen lots of bullet and shrapnel wounds, and I was confident that this was a wound of entrance. Also, the doctors at Parkland were convinced it was a wound of entrance. A wound of entrance and a president sitting facing forward as they went down Elm Street and Dealey Plaza had to be an assault from the front. This meant that if there were shots from behind, there had also to be shots from in front. I felt compelled uh, because I had responsibilities for the National Institute of Mental Health and the National Institute of Neurological Diseases and Blindness, where I was head of the intramural research activities, uh, to call over to Bethesda Naval Hospital to talk with the guy who was going to do the autopsy. This was well before the body had been brought up from Dallas to Andrews Air Force Base. I got on the line with uh, Commander James Humes. We had a pleasant, instructive conversation. I told Humes I'd heard this information about a neck wound and uh, asked him if he'd heard the same. He said he'd been avoiding listening or looking at television in relation to the assassination because he was anxious to be clear-minded and wanted to prepare himself for the autopsy. At any rate, I told him I thought it was very important that he explore the wound and find the passage of the bullet or fragment and uh, discover where the bullet went and where any of its uh, damage might have been done. I said further that uh, because this was uh, a wound of entry, and I was confident of that because of my 
direct personal experience that um, that meant there was a, an assault on the president from in front. About that point, he went off the telephone for a few minutes and a few seconds and uh, came back on the phone and said, Dr. Livingston, I'm sorry I can't continue the conversation. The FBI won't let me. I wished him well and uh, we ended the conversation. And that's been the last time you talked with Dr. Hume? That's the last time I talked with Dr. Hume. Um, there were stories that the body was flying back to Washington Correct. Uh, by the time you had called him. Um, what made you, what, what compelled you to call Dr. Hume? Did well, I called over. I didn't know who was doing the autopsy. I did, called did you, over and did you talked to the would, Did you assume that it would it would be a military autopsy? I didn't know. It, it was at the military hospital. Mm -hmm. But um, I called over <coughs> and talked to the operator, and uh, she put me in touch with the officer of the day. And I've forgotten who that was, but he knew me by reputation anyway. And so he put me right through to Commander James Humes. And Humes knew at that time that he was... Yes. Oh, yes. Going to be doing the autopsy. Yes. Okay. How, how did how did you place the time of the phone call? Well, <coughs> I uh, don't know exactly what time it was, but uh, it was certainly well before the plane arrived from um, Dallas to Andrews Air Force Base. I was glued to the television at that time and remember the plane plane's arrival and. Uh, the casket being lowered and so forth, and seeing Jackie Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and the Johnsons and so on. Now, I would guess that it was sometime between 3.30 and 4, but it may have been 4.30 or so. Well, the, the plane arrived after 6, but I'm it talking about the time of my telephone conversation with oh, Dr. Okay. Humes. Yeah. <laughs> At the time I talked with Dr. Humes would have been somewhere between, let's say, 3.30 and 4.30, something like that. And, and why is your recollection that it's around that time? Is there anything that stands out about, about that particular time of day or anything that, that helps you come to the conclusion? That it was well, I don't think the exact time is necessary mm -hmm. uh, or significant. Um, I just thought it was... Uh, valuable to Humes, uh, if he didn't know already, that there was this neck wound. It might have been compromised by the tracheostomy and might be overlooked on that account. Uh, further, um, I felt a certain responsibility in my role as scientific director for two of the National Institutes of Health, both of which were pertinent to the question of how the president was damaged and how the damage would be interpreted. So it was a perfectly natural thing to call him. And where did you place the call from? From my home in the kitchen. Um, while, while you were talking to Dr. Humes uh, during the conversation, did you look out kitchen windows? Do you remember the degree of, of the afternoon? Uh, is there anything that can help place the time? Of this well, it was light outside, uh, so I know it was uh, fairly dark when the plane landed. I can remember seeing the approaching lights of the plane as it came into Andrews Air Force Base, as seen on television. And it was dark, certainly, when the uh, casket was being lowered and the family was being greeted and so on. Um, going to my notes. How was that? Sure. I think it was. Um, back again uh, with Dr. Livingston. Uh, there is a person who can corroborate this, and that is your wife. Uh, was she in, in the kitchen with you while you were making the call? Yes. Uh, and then, of course, there was conversation after you hung up the phone between the two of you. Yes. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, of course, we were both devastated by the events of the day, and uh, I uh, wondered aloud with her why the FBI would interfere with a phone conversation between two physicians 
that concerned the nature of the conduct of the autopsy. And uh, I didn't attach the significance that I would attach to it now, namely that already Dr. Humes, as well as the autopsy, was under non-medical control. Mm. Uh, here, here's, a, here's a question. Uh, have you ever been contacted by the FBI about this? No, but I have a big file with the FBI. I haven't tried to recover that from the <laughs> Freedom of Information Act, but um, I was actually uh, followed for almost two years on the day and night uh, coverage. I used to commiserate with these guys who'd sit outside in the cold in the winter in Bethesda and offer to bring them hot chocolate or something like that, but they'd wave me away. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I think that uh, the FBI concern about me, or if it was FBI, I don't know, uh, would have related to my anti-nuclear efforts. And would the, this wouldn't have been around this time no, period after? No, no. Okay. Um, moving on, um, there was another person uh, connected to the events in Dallas that, that, that you knew on a personal basis um, as well, and that was Richard Dudman. Yeah, Dick Dudman was a classmate of mine at Stanford. He was a very famous reporter from the Post, uh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Uh, he telephoned me either that day or the next day from Dallas to uh, tell me about a hole in the windshield of the limousine in which the president had been riding. We had uh, supper within uh, the week after or so, my wife and his wife and I together, uh, and he told me at length about the uh, windshield. He saw a hole through the windshield, and when he tried to approach to put his pin through it to be sure it was through penetrated, and to look at the spaling to see which direction the bullet wound had come from, bullet hole had come from, um, he was denied access to the limousine by the Secret Service, told to go away. The uh, windshield hole uh, wasn't in the windshield, or presumably wasn't in the windshield, uh, when Kennedy started off in the motorcade mm -hmm. and before the uh, limousine turned from Houston Street to Elm Street, so it must have been acquired before it got to the Parkland Hospital, mm -hmm. and uh, this implies that uh, it came from gunshot, uh, presumably. And uh, from the slant of the windshield uh, and the direction of the movement of the car, it would not be possible to make a hole in the windshield uh, from a direct hit from the Texas School Book Depository building. And that implied, again, that there must be another gunman. Mm. Now, I just understood uh, from recent information that a bullet was found in the uh, car when the car was dismantled for reconditioning, uh, that a bullet was found in that partition between the Secret Service men's uh, riding in the front and the main compartment where uh, Connolly and... Uh, the Connellys and the Kennedys were writing. And we should also clarify, I think, that, that this dismantling, of course, was done not during Secret Service examination no. that weekend, no. but, but soon after. It was done under contract uh, for uh, refurbishing uh, of the Lincoln limousine and was found by a workman in uh, Cincinnati where that uh, contract was fulfilled. And, and another piece of evidence uh, that I just want to put on the record for this interview. Uh, in 1975, on Canadian radio out of Toronto, CFTR, on a five-part series called Thou Shalt Not Kill, there was a telephone interview done by one of the reporters uh, with a police officer, a sergeant by the name of Stavis Ellis, who was one of the motorcycle officers in the motorcade. And during the telephone interview, he says, he showed the bullet hole in the windshield to Officer Cheney, and he said that he could stick a pencil right 
through uh -huh, the this windshield. I hadn't known. This is very interesting. And Doug, Dick Dudman, who lives in Maine now, will be very interested to hear that. I because if the if a uh, if the hole was probed and was through and through at that time, that's very important evidence. Yes. Uh, Again, it was CFTR, and again, it was Sergeant Stavis Ellis during a phone conversation taped and broadcast in Toronto in 75. I'd like to have a copy of this broadcast available to Dick Dudman. Okay, I'll make sure he gets it. Thank you. Uh, moving on. Um, you worked across the street from Bethesda? I worked across the street from the Bethesda Naval Hospital in the National Institutes of Health. There's a big area there with many buildings and laboratories and facilities. Um, another area we wanted to get into, uh, the sighting by, by at least six of, of the medical staff at Parkland Hospital of cerebellum protruding from the wound. Yes. And your thoughts on that? Yes. Uh, the first direct uh, report about cerebellum sticking out of the wound was uh, attributed to an orderly and then later to a nurse and were radio broadcasts. And um, sometime later, uh, I think all of the doctors at Parkland Hospital have testified under oath that cerebellum in large amounts was sticking out of the wound in the back of the president's head. And those doctors are not likely to be um, mistaken in identification of cerebellum because it has a very different uh, pattern of, of uh, striations and so on. At any rate, um, the idea that cerebellum was sticking out of the wound was striking to me because this means that there must have been a force from below and in front that could rupture the tentorium that partitions the main cerebral hemispheres from the cerebellum. must have ruptured that and then forced uh, cerebellum out. And... Um, That could not likely have occurred with shots from behind and above because that would have forced the tentorium downward and the cerebellum downward and would probably not have uh, ruptured the cerebellum unless it was uh, directly hit. If the um, bullets from behind hit well below and behind the president's head, uh, down low, it would be possible to um, rupture the tentorium from below and to disrupt the cerebellum considerably, but I don't see that it would be likely to push cerebellum posteriorly out the wound. Now, since all the doctors uh, agree that cerebellum was sticking out, extruding from the wound, now this is a very important observation because in the archives, photographs that are said to be the photographs of Kennedy's brain show the cerebellum to be intact. Photographs taken from superior view and from a lateral view both show the cerebellum undisturbed. This is absolutely not possible in conjunction with the testimony we have from Parkland Hospital that the cerebellum was sticking out of the wound. In other words, I'm driven to the incontrovertible recognition that given the cerebellum sticking out of the wound, and I trust those doctors, including neurosurgeon Kemp Clark, who's well known to me as an expert neurosurgeon. Their testimony that they saw cerebellum is convincing to me. This means that the photograph in the archives is not a photograph of the brain of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Um, one of the things I wanted to do was, was to humanize this a little bit, um, in that you met John F. Kennedy on yes. a couple of occasions. Yes, we met on several occasions, and uh, I remember distinctly going uh, on a few occasions to celebrations at the White House or at the British Embassy, for example. At the British Embassy, one evening, my wife and I were dancing right next to Jack and Jackie and looking into each other's eyes and so on. It was a quite personal exchange. Um, I had been enlisted, enrolled in the... Uh, Public Health Service activity during the Eisenhower administration and witnessed the transformation of the American government between Eisenhower and Kennedy. I was very inspired by Kennedy's 
desire to get um, information on all sides of issues and to try to create a rational discipline of government. Uh, his Alianza para Progresa was terribly important to our relations with South America and Latin America. His uh, comportment during the Cuban Missile Crisis was restrained as was that of Khrushchev and uh, I think that their mutual empathy during that crisis uh, when the world came so close to the possible uh, disaster of a nuclear war that we had a very good chance then of building good bridges between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States. I think that um, the partial test ban treaty that was achieved shortly after that was very significant. I think that the President's American University speech was very important in respect to that. And further, I think that um, John Newman's book on JFK and Vietnam uh, gives very good uh, evidence that uh, Kennedy wanted to get out of uh, Vietnam. In fact, uh, McNamara has uh, uh, travel had traveled to um, Saigon just the summer of '63 and fall of '63 in Honolulu and, and later in Washington had confirmed that. Um, uh, it was best for the United States to leave the fighting in Vietnam to the South Vietnamese government and uh, for us to get out of there. Kennedy had ordered 1,000 of the um, U.S. observers. There were no combat uh, people in Vietnam at that time. 1,000 of them to be withdrawn before the end of 1963 and his intention was to draw, withdraw all the rest of them by the end of 1965. Well, there was a complete about-face on that matter uh, within four days of Kennedy's assassination by Johnson and uh, by December of 1965. Um, there were more than 200,000 U.S. troops in Vietnam. Um, I, I, I'm looking forward to this afternoon when you give your presentation because I assume that one of the questions people are going to be asking is, it's been 30 years now since the assassination. Why have you waited so long to tell this story? Well, I have uh, had a greater confidence in the American democratic process than I do now. And uh, I had uh, presumed that uh, the closure of the books, which was done shortly after the assassination of Kennedy, would uh, not last as long as it has lasted. And I would be, I would like to be at the forefront of asking that the documents be completely released. It seems to me that uh, there were conspicuous Cold War dangers at that time, and maybe the documentation would have revealed things that uh, would be sensitive. But at this time, it doesn't seem to me that there's any justification whatsoever for the public to be denied full access to information relating to the assassination of Kennedy. Amazing. Uh, doctor, I want to thank you very much for your time and, and for this interview. Appreciate it's a pleasure, it. Randy.